السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وأصلي وأسلم على النبي الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه من صار على سبيله ونهجه واستنى بسنته واقتفى أثره بإحسان لا يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد I welcome you to another class in this journey رحلة إلى الآخرة the journey through to the hereafter in which we're going through in a series how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take the human being Bani Adam from the moment that Allah creates them in the womb of their mother all the way till their final destination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will create the human being in the womb of their mother. And for those of you who have been attending and have attended the first class and the first few classes from the beginning, we discussed how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decree and appoint angels, malaika, in which their job, they're commissioned to uh, decree a number of things when a person is in the womb of their mother. And from those things, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees creation from his wisdom, when Allah decrees creation of an individual, of a human being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when that individual is in the womb of their mother, will assign the angel to write down a number of things and from them is the person's provision, their rizq, how much they will earn, how much they will receive, the income that they will have. From that, uh, what the angels will write down or note down is, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said, ajal, their time span, their lifespan, the time that they will spend upon this dunya. Also from the things that the angels will note down or scribe if you like is whether the individual will be from those who are wretched or from those who are going to be from the virtuous shaqi or sa'id whether they're going to be from the wretched and whether they're going to be from or whether they're going to be from the virtuous the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam because we took that whole hadith that hadith of abdullah ibn mas'ud that speaks about the beginning of creation for a human being the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam at the end of that hadith he mentioned that an individual they can be performing the, uh, uh, the deeds of the people of paradise and then between them and paradise is an arm span and then meaning they're so close to entering into paradise but what happens is just before they pass away and leave the dunya they perform the acts of the people of the fire of hell they perform the acts of the people of the fire of hell and they enter into the fire of hell billah. and as for another individual they spend their whole life performing acts of the people of the fire of hell and then between them and the fire of hell is again a dhira'a, a hand span so what happens is right towards the end of their life they're about to leave this dunya they perform the acts of the people of paradise one khutbah, one lecture, one reminder, one event occurred in their life and they begin to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they change their ways towards the end of their life. And because they perform the acts of the people of paradise towards the end of their life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He decrees that they enter into paradise, that they enter into Jannah. And so this hadith, it shows us a number of things, a number of benefits can be derived from this hadith. The main benefit that every single one of us should understand is that the believer is the one who is between hope and fear. They have this level of tawazul, balance, in the sense that they don't have too much fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when a person fears or has too much fear and they go to the extreme, what will happen is they will have no motivation to worship Allah, they will have no motivation to perform good deeds. And at the same time, the believer, they are not too hopeful. They are not too hopeful in the sense that you have a green card, you have the green light to do anything that you want to do. Okay, so I can perform the kabair, I can perform the major sins, I can perform the minor sins, I can do anything. But I will eventually enter into paradise. If you have this mentality, this is not the mentality of the believer. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this hadith is evidence of that knows your final abode. The individual spent their whole life worshipping Allah but just towards the end, they spoil it all and they perform 
the sins that will allow them or the sins that will cause them rather to enter into the fire of hell. And the individual, they spend their whole life disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and towards the end they perform a good deed that is so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah allows them to enter into paradise because of that good deed or those good deeds that they perform. So the believer is between hope and fear. The believer is between hope and fear. And hence Ibn, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said the believer is like the bird. The bird, it has two wings, hope and fear. Khawf and raja. Khawf and raja. Hope and fear. So the believer is the one that it balances between, he or she, they balance between both. What happens when you go to either extremes? You fall out of the realms of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And this is an important issue because many of the deviant groups that began to appear in Islamic history, it is because of this issue. Khawf and Raja'ah. So you have the Khawarij that went to one extreme and they made takfir upon anyone who performs major sins. Meaning you've left the fold of Islam if, you've left the fold of Islam if you perform an act of major sin, an act which is considered major sin. They would deem that to be disbelief and hence you are no longer a Muslim. Your Islam has become nullified. And Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, we say no. The person is still a Muslim if they perform a major sin, if they commit a major sin. They are sinful, yes, in the sight of Allah, but they still have Iman within them. And there are many ahadith. That, I, that is evident for that from them is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he said that when a person commits a sin they commit zina, fornication or adultery or they're stealing when they're performing that sin Iman it leaves the body and it hovers over their head and hence they have no remorse or regret then whilst they're performing the sin but then when they finish performing the act or when they finish performing the sin that Iman re-enters them and hence after performing or after committing that sin, they have remorse and regret. They have remorse and regret. And at the same time, we don't go to the extreme of having too much hope. Because another group appeared in Islamic history known as the Murji'ah. This group, this deviant group believed that you can do anything, halal, haram, major, minor, any of the sins, you can perform them all and your Iman will be like the Iman of Jibra'il and Mikail, the angels of Allah. Meaning you will still have the final abode of paradise, you will still have a high level of Iman regardless of the sins that you perform. And Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, we say no. We say that your Iman, it will increase with good deeds and it will decrease with sin. It will decrease with sin and so the believer is between both sides, between both uh, extremes if you like between both extremes so this is just the first part of our series just to recap for those of you who may have missed it then this is the first stage the womb of the mother the second stage is Dar dunya so Dar ad dunya is the second stage stage one was in the womb of your mother fi batni ummi the womb of your mother the second stage is Dar ad dunya This worldly life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed every single one of us upon. We are currently going through this second stage. This is the second stage. The third stage is what is to come. Dar al-Barzakh The th third stage is the life within the grave known as Barzakh which is a barrier between this life and the next life. But nonetheless, this is a stage because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned a number of things will occur during this stage. And this was dealt in detail in a number of previous classes. And the final stage is Dar al-Akhirah. Dar al-Akhirah, which is the final abode, which will be the hereafter. And even when you go to this fourth stage which we are currently upon there are smaller events that need to be analyzed that need to be studied that need to be looked at so Dar al-Akhirah will begin with an introduction does anyone remember what that introduction is how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establish Dar al-Akhirah anyone remember yeah before that what will signify the resurrection what will indicate the resurrection Jazakallah khair. 
the blowing of the trumpet and the trumpet will be blown as Allah mentions in the Quran in a number of different places this is the introduction and we spent one whole lesson discussing the trumpet what is the trumpet what is its description who is commissioned to blow into the trumpet is it a single blow is it two blows is it three blows what are the references in the Quran and Sunnah so the introduction to Yawm Al-Qiyamah or Dar Al-Akhirah, this, this fourth stage is the blowing of the trumpet. And then the next event that will occur is Khuruj, Min Al-Qubur, the exiting from the grave. And we mentioned that from the names of Yawm Al-Qiyamah is Yawm Al-Khuruj, the day of exiting. Yawm Al-Qiyamah, as we mentioned, the day of judgment, it has a number of different names. Some of the surah of the Quran that we memorize, that we read, Qari'a, Zalzala, Ghashiya, Naba, all of these are names for the single day, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Yawm Al-Khuruj is one of those names of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the day of exiting. Why? Because this is a day in which people will exit from their graves. Everyone will exit from their graves, those who have been buried. And we spent a whole lesson as well discussing how people will exit. Because we know that not everyone will exit the same. The way the pe believers will exit, the way the disbelievers will exit, the way the hypocrites will exit, there will be different ways. The one who dies performing Umrah, the one who dies in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised them uh, honorary resurrection. And as, the as for the individual who dies committing a sin, or an individual who dies upon kufr, or nifaq, hypocrisy, disbelief, their resurrection is one which is wretched, which shows you the importance of the ending. The ending. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to us, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالِ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ Deeds are based upon, they are dependent upon their ending. So it isn't how you begin the race, it is how you finish the race. And so, the way that you end your life, or the way that death comes to you, this will be the beginning of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Meaning, this will be how Allah will resurrect you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So if you die in a state of sin, in a state of disobedience, dhunub, ma'asi, disobedience to Allah, you will be resurrected performing that sin on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. But if you, are, if you pass away and death reaches you, or it comes to you when you uh, are performing a good deed, worshipping Allah, coming closer to Allah, you will be resurrected as though you're performing that good deed. As though you're performing that good deed. And we mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, in the previous class that we had, the individual who they die whilst performing a good deed. They die whilst performing a good deed and they never finished that good deed. Because the previous class, for those of you who were here, we spoke about receiving of the books, which is another stage. Receiving of the books, what will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala record in the books? And from them we mentioned or the, main, the three things that will be recorded for the individual, or the things that will be recorded for the individual, they are three. They are three. And we mentioned what they were. We mentioned, for example, the first one was the intention. A person had the intention to perform something, but they never performed that good deed or that bad deed because of some sort of impediment. They couldn't perform the good deed because they wanted to do it, but they wanted to perform the good deed, but they couldn't because something had occurred and it was out of their control. Hence, they were unable to perform that good deed. The intention, it is recorded there for them. And when they perform the good deed, that is also recorded. That is number two. And number three, those deeds which were not completed in the dunya, but they will be recorded as though they were completed. And we gave a classic example, that which Allah mentions in the Quran, regarding the people who migrate. So people who want to migrate from an area in which they cannot practice Islam, a land in which they cannot practice Islam, they want to go to a place where they can practice Islam and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happens if they die midway? Is that recorded as a good deed? Is that recorded as hijrah, migration for them? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He confirmed that within the Quran that yes, it is. If they die halfway, if they haven't reached their final destination, it doesn't matter because they began their journey and they had the intention to finish and to migrate to such and such land where they could practice Islam, Allah will record it for them as though they have completed that migration 
as though they have completed that good deed. Those are the three things which are recorded. And the opposite is true as well. So the individual, they have a bad niyyah. They have a intention to perform evil. But they couldn't perform that evil because of an impediment. Okay, They wanted to steal, but they couldn't steal because the, when they got there, they found the shop, the bank, whatever it may be. They found that there was security uh, arcading the whole bank. And so they couldn't. So it will still be recorded for them in their books. That they had the intention. Had the security not been there, they would have performed that sin to steal. And then if they actually perform that sin, that is number two, that is a second recording, meaning the deeds that they actually perform. And number three, those sins that they were performing and they couldn't finish performing, it will be recorded as though they fulfilled or completed that sin. So that was where we were, or this was where we were, in fact, um, in, in this journey, Rihla ila al we have reached up to this stage. So, as the brother mentioned, the introduction to Yawmul Qiyamah, Darul Akhirah, the final abode, is the blowing of the trumpet, and then the exiting from the grave, and then going towards Ardul Mahshar, the land of gathering, which we said was, as the Ahadith mentioned, in modern day Levant. The Levant area, modern day Syria, Jordan, Palestine, that area. And we mentioned how the earth was going to be like a loaf of bread. Khubzun wahid. It is going to be like one loaf of bread. It is going to be like a reddish, whitish color. There won't be any landmarks. There won't be any buildings. So a person can't say on that day that this is my place or this was the place that I used to work at. This is the place or this street I lived here. There will be no mountains. Everything will be a plain level field. So we discussed the books, receiving of the books. And inshallah ta'ala, the next event that we will be discussing today, inshallah ta'ala, is the scales. The scales. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he refers to the scales in the Quran, both in the singular form as well as the dual form. Or the plural form, if you like. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the Qur'an, وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا وَوَضَعَ الْمِيزَانِ And the sky in Surah Al-Rahman has been raised and the scales will be bought. The scale will be bought. In another place in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, وَنَضَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ الْقِصْطَ لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ فَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا وَإِنْ كَانَ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِّنْ خَرْدَلٍ أَتَيْنَا بِهَا وَكَفَى بِنَا حَاسِبِينَ and we will bring the scales of justice, mawazin, the scales of justice, فَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا And no soul will be oppressed in the slightest of ways. Shay'a meaning nothing. There will be no oppression for any human being on that day. وَإِنْ كَانَ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِّنْ خَرْدَلٍ أَتَيْنَا بِهَا وَكَفَى بِنَا حَاسِبِينَ And even if there was something equal to the weight of a mustard seed or an atom's weight, the smallest amount possible, Allah says, Atayna biha, we are going to come with it. It is going to be brought. Wa bina hasibin, and Allah says, sufficient are we as someone to hold to account. So these are the references given in the Quran for these scales. The scales, as the uh, hadith mentioned, it is two pans. So when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentions in his sunnah the trumpet, or he mentions the receiving of the books, or he mentions the scales, like what we're discussing today, it isn't how we see things in the dunya. It isn't how we see things as the dunya. So the trumpet isn't like a trombone, okay, that we see played by orchest orchestras and musical musicians, okay. The Prophet wasallam he described it simply so that we can understand. Okay? So that we can understand. Likewise, the books. The books, they are not like a small book with a few pages because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he clarifies in the Quran that everything is going to be recorded. The time, the action, the location, whether it was a statement, whether it was an action, all of that will be recorded. Likewise, the scales. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said the scales will have two pans, two pans, so two sides. The scholars, they differ as to whether the scales, the mawazin, whether it will have a pointer. They differed 
there is no authentic hadith. There is no authentic hadith that I've come across that mentions that there is a pointer to the scales. But there were companions and tabi'een like Ibn Abbas and uh, Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullahu ta'ala wa radiyallahu ta'ala an anhuma that mention that it, there is a pointer on the scale. However, there is no authentic hadith. Ala kulli hal, it doesn't matter whether it does or doesn't have. This isn't important for us to know. But rather what is important for us to know is how will the scales be utilized in Yawmul Qiyamah? What is the maqsad? What is the objective of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having the scales there? Does anyone know? Why? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a question. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that this individual is going to be from the people of the fire of hell, or this individual is going to be from the people of paradise, Allah knows their deeds, Allah has seen their worship, Allah has seen their disobedience, okay? Why, what is the purpose of having the scales? Yeah. That was, that was one of the reasons as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does the, the questioning. So yes, you're, you're on, the, on, on the right track. Something a bit more broader, inshallah. Yeah. Sorry? The torture. Okay, so yes, so yes, Jazakallah khair, yes. So, so, so to, as a hujjah, to establish the proof, to establish the proof, and as the br brother mentioned as well, to increase in their hasra, to increase in their regret, and to increase in their remorse. Okay, the disbelievers, those who would disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a number of reasons as to why we mentioned, a number of reasons scholars that mention as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does all of these things. For example, the receiving of the books and the weighing of the good deeds and the hisab, the accountability, the questioning. Uh, and we discussed it in great detail. There, was about, there, were, there were about eight or nine points in one of the previous classes that we discussed. Why does Allah have all of these events? If a person is going to enter into the fire of hell or if a person is going to enter into paradise, why have, why have these events in Yawm al and the scholars they mentioned what uh, a number of reasons but the brothers have mentioned um, the, 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 the common few number one is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will want to increase in the hasra the remorse for the disbelievers that it wasn't anyone else that would perform the, these sins you yourself performed these sins and now today you are in trouble because of the repercussions of these sins number one number two as the brother mentioned, to establish the proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever he's going to bring forward, is a proof against you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't simply make a claim, okay, you are from the people of the fire of hell. Allah is al-adl, he is just, the most just. So if Allah makes a claim, then Allah is going to present some evidence or establish some evidence against you. Number three, to show how Allah is Kamal, the completeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of His justice. His justice is Kamal, Ahsan. Okay? It is perfect. It is complete. Allah is the most just. Okay? Yes, you're going to enter into the fire of hell, you're going to enter into paradise, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show you your deeds, measure them in front of you so that you have no excuse. لا تعتذروا Don't make any excuses today. Okay? You can't make any excuses today because everything has been presented and Allah will show you everything. The small, the big. وَبَدَا لَهُمْ سَيِّئَاتُ مَا عَمِلُوا As Allah mentions in the Quran that they will try to hide their actions but everything that is hidden, Allah will make it apparent. Allah is going to make it apparent on يوم القيامة. Everything will be exposed and Allah will show and make everything apparent on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So the scales are there for, to show the, and portray the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Adl. What will be weighed? There are two main things that will be weighed on these scales. Number one, 
which is the most obvious, are the deeds of people. The deeds of people will be weighed on these scales. The deeds of people will be weighed on the scales. So if a person, and Allah mentions in the Quran, فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ وَمَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فِي جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدُونَ Allah mentions in the Quran, if their good deeds are heavy, then they are from the muflihun. They are from those who are successful. وَمَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ But if their deeds upon the scales, if their light, khafif, then they are going to be from the losers. They are going to be from the losers. And the way that we perceive weighing, okay, and weight, it isn't on your, how it will be on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that an individual, they will have 99 records of sins. And each record is that which the eye can see, as far as the eye can see, the distance the eye can see. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us on Yawm Al-Qiyamah how the eyesight will be. لَقَدْ كُنْتَ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مِّنْ هَذَا فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٍ Today, most surely we have removed the veil or the impediment, the cover, that's a better word, the cover from your eyes, so that you are not in a state of heedlessness. So the scholars of tafsir, they have too many interpretations for this. Number one is that people on the day of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Muslim, non-Muslim, they will have really good eyesight, sharp eyesight. They will be able to see really far because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them sharp eyesight on the day of Yawm Al-Qiyamah so that they can witness and see everything. That is number one. Number two is that for the disbelievers, for the disbelievers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He speaks about them being blind in the Qur'an, that the disbelievers, they are blind, فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورُ When Allah mentions regarding the disbelievers, that nay, it isn't their eyes which are blind, but rather it is their hearts which are blind. This is a blindness in which they are blind from the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Blind from the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the meaning or the second meaning of this verse or another meaning of this verse, which is a more comprehensive meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the people of disbelief see the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, it will be of no benefit today. It will be of no benefit on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Because one of the statements that the people of the fire of hell will say when they enter into the, par- into the fire of hell, رَبَّنَا أَبْصَرْنَا وَسَمِعْنَا فَرْجِعْنَا نَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا إِنَّا مُوقِنُونَ That, O oh Allah, O oh our Lord, Absarna, we have seen. Wasami'na, and we have heard. We've seen, we've heard. Farji'na na'mal saliha. So return us back to the worldly life. Inna muqinun. We are going to be from those who are certain. We have yaqeen now. Okay, ya Allah, now send us back. We're not going to be problematic in the dunya. We're not going to disobey you. We're going to worship you. But are they going to be returned? No. So everyone's eyesight will be sharp on that day. And even for the disbelievers, they will be able to see the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person, individual, will have 99 files of sins. And they will have one file uh, that is a good deed. And what is that file? It is the kalima. La ilaha illallah. Tawheed. The oneness of Allah. It will be placed on the scale. And that one deed, that kalima, that statement, La ilaha illallah will outweigh the 99 files or the 99 scrolls of bad deeds, of evil deeds. So our perception, our weighing, our measurement, the way that we benchmark isn't the, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will measure on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So this is number one. Number one is the deeds of people. Number two and number two, you can actually split into subcategories as well, or subcategory if you like. Number two is the actual human being. The actual human being. Because the Prophet wasallam he said, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, there will be a big man who will be brought forward. Meaning all they did in the dunya, 
was eat and just become big in size and they will be weighed on the mizan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they won't weigh the weight of a mosquito in the sight of Allah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day isn't going to measure how many kilograms you weigh or how much stones you weigh Allah isn't going to measure that in another hadith the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an he once climbed a tree he once climbed a tree and he had shins which were thin and the companions began to laugh because his shins became exposed because they laughed, they laughed at how thin his shins were. And so the Prophet wasallam said to them, why are you laughing? And so the, the companions ajma'in, they said, we're laughing because of the shins of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, they're so thin. He said to them as in response, the Prophet wasallam, do you laugh at the shins of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud? For Allah, by Allah, in the sight of Allah, it is more heavier it is more heavier, the shins of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, than the size of Mount Uhud. It is more heavier in the sight of Allah than Mount Uhud. Because Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an was a scholar from the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. So number one was deeds. Number two, it is individuals. And also people's limbs will also be measured. Limbs. There is another hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in which an individual will come forward. And the Prophet وسلم, he told us and he said that no one is going to enter into paradise except by the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one is going to enter into paradise except by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the companions were amazed, O oh, Messenger of Allah, even you. And he, the Prophet وسلم, said, Yes, even me. This is the Prophet of Allah, the best of creation, Khairul Bariya. He receives revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from above the seven heavens. Even he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam isn't going to enter into paradise by, the, by his actions, but by the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said an individual is going to come on yawm al-qiyamah. And this individual is going to say to Allah, Oh Allah, I don't want to be measured or favored, if you like, by your rahmah, by your mercy. But rather, Oh Allah, I want to be weighed, measured, benchmarked by my good deeds. This individual performed 70, 80 years worth of good deeds. So Allah will say, okay. So Allah will say, present his, the, present the blessing of eyesight. Present the blessing of eyesight that we bestowed upon him. Allah is going to say the eyesight, the blessing of eyesight that I gave to him or her, present it on the scales. And on the other side, place all of their good deeds that they performed in those 70, 80 years. And what will happen? All of that ibadah, all of that worship of 70, 80 years isn't even equivalent to the blessing of eyesight. This individual wanted to weigh up their worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, I've performed good deeds. I have ibadah in my account. Because of what you've given to me, I want to now balance it out okay I worshipped you and you gave me and I worshipped you so let's balance it let's call it even it isn't going to work on Yawm Al-Qiyamah all of that worship for 70, 80 years of that individual isn't going to equal the weight of the blessing of eyesight and this individual will realize their mistake and say oh Allah I need your mercy oh Allah I need your rahmah because all of the ibadah that we perform 70, 80 years of worship not even equivalent to the blessing of eyesight. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the Quran, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he blesses, if you were to count the blessings of Allah upon you, لَا تُحْسُوهَا You will not be able to count them. You will not be able to count them, you will not be able to numerate them. So, deeds will be weighed on the scales. People will be weighed on the scales and people's limbs will be weighed on the scales. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I want to conclude with this hadith insha'Allah Ta'ala, he mentioned, or he found one day his wife, Aisha Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha, our mother crying. And he said to her, Ma yubkik, why are you crying? What makes you cry? So she said, O Messenger of Allah, the kartun nar fabakait. O Messenger of Allah, I remembered the fire of hell and I began to cry. 
So then she said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, هل تنفعون أهليك أو هل تذكرون أهليك يوم القيامة? O oh, Messenger of Allah, will you remember your family on يوم القيامة? Will you remember me? Will you remember your wives, your children on يوم القيامة? She wanted to know. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in response, ثلاثة مواطين لا يذكر أحد أحد. He said to her, as for three stages or three events, no one is going to remember anyone. And from those three stages is the scales, the mizan, the scales. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is judging between people and measuring their deeds, people will be in a state of fear and people will be in a state of uncertainty because they don't know what the outcome is going to be. Because if that scale weighs more to the left, then they know that what's to come is going to be trouble for them. But if they know that that scale is going to weigh more to the right, then they can have ease. But then what about the individual whose scales are going to be equal? That inshallah ta'ala we will discuss in one of the upcoming classes bi ta'ala. So we're going to conclude here inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullahu khair. If you have any questions, we can take them. If not, then inshallah we can conclude. Yeah. You perform the deed, yeah? So the first one is so okay. So just to just to clarify, so for, for those who want uh, who didn't hear the question, um, the brother's question was: um, we mentioned that there are going to be three types of recordings in the book, okay, in the register, the book that a person has. The first one is a person's intention, meaning they don't perform the sin or the good deed, but they have that intention, but because of some reason, they weren't able to perform the sin or the good deed they couldn't perform it and hence that intention is recorded for them good or bad number one number two meaning they haven't performed it they had the intention number two is they do the they have the intention and they perform the deed they perform the action that's clear number three is they have the intention and they start the deed but they don't finish they start the sin but they don't finish the sin is that clear you don't finish the sin. On the, on the flip side, you start the good deed. Like for example, migration, hijrah. You, s you have the intention that tomorrow, tonight, I'm going to make the intention that tomorrow morning, I'm going to migrate to a Muslim land. So you have the intention today. That's ticked. Tomorrow you set off. After Salatul Fajr, you set off and you reach a point and Allah decrees death for you. But you've started the deed in comparison to the first recording, it is just the intention. So for example, you just have the intention to migrate today, but then tomorrow someone comes and tells you that, look, you can't migrate. Why? Because you have an elderly mother. You have to look after her. The Sharia states that you have to look after your elderly parents and whatnot. And because of that, you weren't able to migrate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still record it as a good deed for you because it is something beyond your control. Clear? Um, for those of you who want to ask a question on this Slido app, inshallah, I believe it's the hereafter. That's the keyword, inshallah. So it all depends on what is the impediment or what, what stops the individual from performing the sin. Okay, so if we take sin, a person has an intention to perform a sin, okay? So the person, like I said, wants to rob the bank, okay? And they go and they find that there's security there. They have the intention, but they go and they find security there, so they can't. That is going to be recorded as though they committed the sin, because had the security been not been there, then they would have committed the sin. However, if they were on their way to the bank, 
But then they remember, subhanallah, what I'm doing is not correct. I might be able to gain in the dunya, but what will I say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on yawmul qiyamah? And then they turn around and then they go back. Then for them, they have a good deed. They have a good deed. And it's not recorded as a, a sinful intention. Okay? Anyone else? Yeah. <coughs> so the brother is asking a question about the the uh, the weighing of the eyesight and the um, the the ibadah. Okay. So that is a hadith. A man will come. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will come on yawm al qiyamah, and he said, the Prophet sallallahu said, a man will come on yawm al qiyamah. An individual will come and they will say that, Oh Allah, I want to be judged according to my actions. I want to be judged according to my ibadah. So Allah will say, okay, let's see just the blessing of eyesight. And the hadith mentions eyesight, the ayn. Okay, the hadith mentions eyesight, the blessing of eyesight. Not the blessing of hearing, not the blessing of eating, the blessing of eyesight. The hadith, it mentions it clearly. Yeah? Anyone else? Is it necessary? Oh, so we'll take it. We'll take the questions from the slide up. If there's no other questions, there. Eh? Okay. So someone's asked a question. Is it necessary to say the iqama if you are praying yourself? The answer is no. You don't need to say the iqama if you're praying by yourself. The iqama is for the congregational prayer. Um, and if you want to say the iqama to yourself, if you're praying by yourself, and there is no problem, but it's not. It is not a condition if you're praying by yourself. Um, do you have any tips for confidence when delivering a khutbah or a talk? The tips would be general and every person would differ from person to person. Uh, to be confident, you need to have good speaking skills, you need to prepare, you need to plan, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and just practice, generally. Practice, uh, as they say, makes perfect. So whatever field, whatever job, whatever skill you want to learn, practice is, is the best way, inshallah ta'ala. And if you are able to see some of those uh, speakers that you like, their style and whatnot, and if you're able to emulate them, then that is a good way, inshallah ta'ala, for you to learn as well. If you make tawbah for a sin, will it still be on your scale? So this is an issue in which the scholars discussed regarding a sin that an individual will uh, has performed. So, on the day of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, so just to repeat the question, that if you make tawbah for a sin, is it on your scale of deeds? Is it on the scales? Uh, there is a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that mentions that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala yudna al-mu'min Yawm Al-Qiyamah min Rabbihi Azza wa Jal. Allah is going to veil the believer on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So it's going to just be between them and Allah, the conversation. Okay? There is no translator, okay, no interpreter, okay, a direct conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is going to say to them, Hal ta'rif kada wa kada wa kada. Do you know that you perform this sin, this sin, this sin, at this location, at this place? And the individual is going to say, Ay Rabb, a'rif, 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 a'rif. Yes. Oh my Lord, I remember, I remember because the person can't lie now because they're standing in front of Allah and Allah's recording is meticulous and he has knowledge of everything. So the person, for this individual, there is no way out. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to this individual, uh, I've veiled that sin for you in the dunya. I never told, made it apparent. I never exposed you to people because of the sin. You committed a sin within the four walls of your bedroom. But I hid that sin from people. And today, I will forgive that sin. And Allah will say to the individual, so move on to the next event on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So if a person makes tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is hoped, it is hoped that that sin is wiped away. And if you look at these ahadith, then the hisab, the questioning, it comes before this, the scales. And so inshallah ta'ala, that sin isn't on your scales because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has wiped it away. Allah has wiped it away because of your tawbah. 
But if you don't make tawbah, then that is going to come back and haunt you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, that sin. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he forgives every single one of us. So uh, someone's asked, I'm a revert. Um, I, have, uh, I help my non-Muslim grandparents with their shopping. Is it a sin to help them uh, buy p alcohol and pork? They pay for the items. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions within the Quran, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Allah says, cooperate with one another in good and righteousness. In performing good and righteousness. وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ And do not cooperate with one another in uh, disobedience to Allah and sins. So when it comes to, for example, Allah mentions in the Quran regarding non-Muslim parents, okay? Non-Muslim parents, those people who gave birth to you, okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the Quran, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا That be good to them, okay? Look after them, take care of them. But then Allah says in the Quran, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ But if they strive to encourage you or to force you to perform shirk or to disbelieve in Allah or to associate partners with Allah, then do not do so. Do not obey them in that. So when it comes to non-Muslim uh, parents, grandparents, if they tell us something which is against our sharia, ah, then it is something that we cannot obey them in. It is something that we cannot obey them in. It is something that we must strive to, uh, to not do because our ultimate ta'a, our ultimate obedience is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is no disobedience in the creator for the obedience of the creation. Is it true that you will be questioned about every sin you committed despite making tawbah? So that, that's the hadith that I mentioned just now. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remind the believer of the sin that they committed. You committed this sin and 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 this sin. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will wipe them away. Allah will wipe them away. Okay? So on Yawm al a person comes, Allah draws the veil, Allah speaks to them. Those sins are not made apparent to the rest of creation Allah questions them Allah reminds them of those sins and then Allah says that all of this has been forgiven all of this has been wiped away and move on to the next stage on uh, next event of Yawm Al Qiyamah How do you encourage a non-Muslim brother who has been considering reverting for over a year to accept Islam sooner than later this is something which, um, something which is extremely important in our religion, to give da'wah. For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would look for every opportunity to give da'wah. And one of the most uh, important methods of giving da'wah is a person's character. So Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala he mentions regarding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, Allah mentions and speaks about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Quran himself, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ فَعَفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Allah says, by the rahmah of Allah, Allah here speaking to the Prophet ﷺ, by the rahmah of your Lord, the mercy of your Lord, you are easy going with them. With who? With Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, all of these companions. You are easy going with them. You displayed affection and love and mercy towards them. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ And had you, if you were rough and tough with them, they would have run away. They would have said, we're not accepting this religion. This religion is too difficult. This religion is too tough. So when it comes to someone who is on the verge of accepting Islam, they are close to accepting Islam. And by the way, in the Sharia, there are a number of people who you can give zakat to. Allah mentions in Surah Tawbah, verse number 60, if I'm not mistaken, from them is وَالْمُؤَلَّفَةِ uh, قُلُوبُهُمْ The one whose heart is close to Islam. Meaning, they are about to enter into Islam, but they just have something which is bothering them or they have the, the, something which is an issue for them. It is permissible in the Sharia ah for zakah to be given to them if it will bring their hearts closer to Islam. So by you giving zakah, it will show to them how generous the Muslims are, how kind and considerate and compassionate the Muslims are. It is permissible for you to give zakah to the individual who is close to accepting Islam. So the main point is character. 
through character and through encouragement and that good deeds as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said badiru bil a'mal fitna badiru bil a'mal fitna ka qit'i al-layl mudlima hasten to perform good deeds before a trial afflicts you that which is like the darkness of the night and what is a better deed than accepting iman and accepting islam okay so encourage okay give da'wah have good character and obviously don't force and be easy going and the more easy going you are and the more encouraging you are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up their hearts bi-idhnillah their hearts will be open bi-idhnillah ta'ala okay so that was the last question if I'm not mistaken yes any other questions before we wrap up inshallah no more هل جائز هذا سؤالك يعني تركه كل شيء فهمت اوكي so the brother is asking for what is the ruling on haircuts um, in which uh, you cut, for example, the, the skin is showing um, and the top part, the skin is, um, uh, sorry, this, the hair is remaining on the top of your head. So what is it called, a fade or when you get zero on the side and the hair on the top remains the same? Is there a name for it? Skin fade, skin fade. The brother's asking regarding the skin fade. This is something which the scholars, they looked at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu and they said that it is not permissible to completely have the skin in which it is skin fade. But if you leave some of the hair, then it is permissible. Okay, so if you have a different number, and the brother mentioned atfal, the children mostly have it, but it is something that is something, it is something that we should be aware of, that to have it completely zero, it is something which um, it, it, it shouldn't be done because the hadith of the Prophet Sallam, he forbade leaving half of it and then keeping half of it. Okay? So it is something which shouldn't be done. But if you have a different, for example, it's not skin fade, completely skin fade. It's not zero. But it is number one, number two here on the side and then uh, you get scissors on the top, then inshallah ta'ala, uh, it is permissible. It is permissible. Yeah? Anyone else? No? Barakallahu feek wa jazakumullahu khair wa sallallahu sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.